So we have well, well established that these pumpkin pie spices have been around for a very long time and they didn't really make their way into the West until, well, the spice trades were opened in the 13th and 14th centuries. Once Europeans got their hands on all these new spices, it didn't take long for them to start using them in baked goods. However, at this point, pumpkins weren't really in play yet, and, well, that's because they didn't really exist yet, or at least not in, like, their known world. Yeah, um, squash and gourds and pumpkins, they're all native to the Americas, and so even though Westerners were finally just gaining access to all these crazy new spices and seasonings from the East, they didn't have all the building blocks for a pumpkin kwai just quite yet. But that all changed when Europeans made their way over to North America, setting the stage for two very important inventions. Liberty and justice for all. And pumpkin pie. Uh, the earliest pumpkin pie spices come from the first century or so of colonial settling in the Americas, uh, during the 1600s actually. Uh, when settlers were introduced to squash by the Native Americans living there, so at this time, the colonists they didn't really have access to ovens so much, like so they just improvised by baking pumpkin puddings and other creams with pumpkins inside of like pumpkin shells on hot ashes. It wasn't around like a century later until the very first American cookbook was released, American Cookery, which contained a legitimate pumpkin pie recipe the way that we think of them today. In 1796, this cookbook, American Cookery, contained a recipe contained contained a recipe for pumpkin pudding baked as a pie which contained stewed pumpkin, cream, eggs, sugar, and spices like nutmeg and ginger. So, not bad, not bad at all. America was barely a decade or two old at this point, and we already had one of the top five best pies of all time. It's bizarre to think we have the phrase American as apple pie when, like, apple pie originated outside of the United States and predates it by centuries. Meanwhile, pumpkin pie, on the other hand, uh, pumpkin pie is American as fuck. Like, who do we talk to to change that expression to American as pumpkin pie? Or, preferably, American as pumpkin pie. Yeah, where's this on the uh, election? Like, I want to know where politicians stand on changing pumpkin pie to the official American pie slogan. I think they're all just so terrible that, like, none of them even have pumpkin pie on their fucking, like, radar. They're all, you know, just... All politicians are, like, evil lizard mole reptilian monsters that live in the ground and don't actually eat pumpkin pie. They uh, they eat the skin of humans for, for sustenance, so they don't have a taste for pumpkins or sugar or anything that's tasty. Anyway... The next big step for pumpkin spice came in 1936 when the Washington Post shared a recipe for a pumpkin spice cake. Yeah, prior to this recipe, uh, there were some loose references to pumpkin pie spice in various cookbooks. Uh, the recipe from the Washington Post was the first to, like, there was, like, concrete documentation of a recipe calling for pumpkin spice. This recipe contained the four facets of pumpkin spice, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, and nutmeg. Though, however, unlike modern pumpkin spice goods, it did still contain pumpkin. This recipe is likely responsible for coining the term pumpkin spice, but we still had another couple decades until we could see pre-made bottles of pumpkin spice on shelves. Yeah, fast forward now to the 1950s when the juggernaut of all spices and seasonings, McCormick, formally introduced commercial pumpkin pie spice, which you could buy at the supermarket, and with that it became a common fixture in most American kitchens. Actually, the phrase juggernaut of spice, it makes me feel like there should have been, like, another member of the Spice Girls. Like, it would be, like, the ultimate Spice Girl. She combines all traits of the other members and combines them into the spiciest girl. Standing in an imposing 6 foot 9 and weighing at 230 pounds, she's scarier than scary spice. Herculean strength and endurance, she's the epitome of sportiness. She's young and she's hungry for combat. But don't let this fearsome facade fool you. She's a classy lady. Posh, you might say. Oh, and also she's Scottish, so she's a ginger, too. Rampaging down the runway, I present to you, Juggernaut Spice. Listen up, if you would like to become my lover, you must get with my friends. Refuse and you'll die. <laughs> what if instead of that, they just had the, like, nega Spice Girls? <laughs> like, their arch nemesis who face off with them. Yeah, you could have had, like, Racist Spice... Old Spice, Hobo Spice? Or maybe Shitty Spice, Pedo Spice, COVID Spice. <laughs> Actually, would the Nega Spice Girls just have like a member who's just called Pumpkin Spice, the queen of all basic bitches? She could be like a former member of the Spice Girls who went rogue and betrayed them all. Man, what a wasted opportunity. They could have done so much world building with Spice Girls lore, but now they're all old and irrelevant. 
Someone needs to write a comic or something about it and start up the Space Girls Aligned Universe. <laughs> I wish. Uh, anyway, moving back to reality. Boring, mediocre reality. Uh, Pumpkin Spice cemented itself as an autumnal favorite over the next few decades after McCormick sort of put it on shelves and until it finally met up with its ultimate destiny, coffee. The first reference we could find to a Pumpkin Spice coffee comes from Home Roast Coffee in Tampa, Florida in 1996. We tried to confirm this info, but it seems like that coffee company closed down at some point and we can't find anything else out about it. If they did invent pumpkin spice coffee, then it seems like the idea spread over the next five years or so to other companies in Las Vegas, Indiana, and Pennsylvania. Yeah, of course, the huge breakout for pumpkin spice coffee didn't really take place until the early 2000s when Peter Dukes, a product manager for Starbucks, came up with their biggest hit of all time, the pumpkin spice latte. In 2003, Dukes, who was a manager in Starbucks' espresso division... It's kind of cute that they apparently divide the company into different coffee divisions, or, hmm, I can't tell if it's cute or pretentious. Either way, Dukes and a panel were tasked with developing a new seasonal drink that could replicate the success of their peppermint mocha latte, which debuted in the holiday season of 2002. At that point, seasonal drinks weren't a big deal for the company, though they had seen a few here and there over the years. For example, we saw a source mention that Starbucks had featured an eggnog latte that goes back as far as late 80s. Yeah, however, the introduction of the peppermint mocha latte around Christmas proved successful, and they were on the prowl to, like, repeat the success again. This guy Dukes and his team put together a list of, like, 20 possible ideas for new coffee drinks, which eventually got whittled down to just four. Originally, the team didn't think much about pumpkin spice uh, flavor coffee, and the higher-ups, like, balked at the idea, and they almost got rid of it. Rather, it seemed that the test groups of Starbucks patrons preferred sweeter, more ham-fisted drinks with lots of chocolate and caramel syrup flavors to drown out any semblance of a coffee flavor they could possibly find. Because, you know, coffee is kind of gross on its own. It's too bitter and... It's bitter. <laughs> I want to see them make a ham-fisted latte that's just... They just fist ham into the latte and it's just like... That's that's how they can they got basic bitches buying pumpkin spice lattes. They can do the ham fisted latte to get all the basic bros. I was gonna say like, you already have like those hams that are covered in cloves. You already have. Hey, there. there you go. Yeah, there you go. Uh, speaking of though, historically these like frilly coffee drinks they got popular with the Starbucks crowd and just like America in general because uh, you know thanks to the prominence of instant coffee in the United States over the last half a century. I guess it makes sense if everyone was just like used to shitty coffee for so long, they probably just got used to like not liking the flavor period, even if the quality of the coffee itself was pretty good. Anyway, Dukes and his team introduced the pumpkin spice latte in their short list of prototypes, regardless of the executive's lack of faith in it. They eventually got the green light to start working in depth on the pumpkin drink, and they began developing a prototype for it. I imagine, like. <laughs> That guy must have gotten such a promotion after that, like, because they were like, nah, 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 pumpkin drink, that's not going to work. And then, like, three years later, they're making, like, millions off it. They were like, take it. Just swimming pool, mansion with a swimming pool in every room, just golden car, the ability, the genome plants that, like, make you just pour coffee out of your fingers. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that guy, he hit the jackpot. Uh, supposedly during that development period, uh, him and his team spent a lot of time eating pumpkin pies and drinking coffee to just get the flavor just right. And then by fall of 2003, they had a formula they settled on, and they launched it at 100 test locations in Seattle, and like we said, it was an instant hit. By the next year, it was a nationwide success, and Starbucks started reintroducing it every single fall to hordes of rabid soccer moms. Obviously, the story doesn't stop there, because now it's time to get modern and see what people have been doing with pumpkin spice lattes in recent history.